Hello and welcome to everyone joining us in this discussion online from all over the world. Growers in the United States and globally face rising challenges, including climate change, limited water and land supply, uncertainties in immigration policies, uh, severe labor shortage and feeding arising population estimated at 9 billion by 2050. A new generation of startups led by women with a diversity of backgrounds and ethnicities are seeking to provide novel perspectives and solution to agriculture's problem with tech innovation. Diversity is often a source of innovation, yet despite large increases in funding, for ag tech companies, only 7% of ag tech and food tech investment funds went to women founded startups in 2019. It is a pleasure having you all in today's panel discussion on women innovators working to solve farming challenges, where we will be looking at the challenges and solutions facing women in the world of ag tech. I am Natasha Akaliza. Together with Haisa Urujeni, we are both program consultants for Dorothy Water for Food Global Institute here in Rwanda, and we'll be both moderators for today's discussion. Today's session features a great uh, panel of insightful women who will be talking about their contribution to solving farming challenges. We have Amy Wu, award-winning journalist, film, filmmaker and founder, and chief content director of From Farms to Incubators. It includes the award-winning documentary From Farm to Incubators and a newly released book by the same name, Spotlighting Women Leaders in Ag and Ag Tech. We have uh, Penelope, Penelope Nego, COO and president of Persistent Data Mining, we are also joined by Fatma Kaplan, the co-founder, CEO, and CSO of Peronim. Last but not least, we have uh, Clara Kinlo, the Director of Innovation Com Commercialization at Danforth uh, Center and IM2 Technical Project Manager. All, particip all participants in the audience will be muted. However, we welcome your participation in the chat box located in the top right of your screen. And there'll also be a time for Q&A at the end of this session. We kindly ask that you keep your comments focused on today's discussion and please be respectful. Now let's start uh, with the first question, which goes to all the panelists. And I would like for our panelists to answer it in a way that is relevant for students and recent graduates in our audience today. This first question is general to all the panelists and I would like for all the panelists to answer it in a way that will be relevant for the students again and recent graduates who are in our audience today. Let me start this conversation with Amy. Uh, Amy, in a few minutes, can you tell us how the idea to start from farm to incubators came up? What was your experience starting a business? Yes, thank you so much, Natasha, for the introduction and really happy to be at the at the summit today. Um, so I am a journalist by background. I have an extensive background, um, years and years as a, as a business and investigative reporter. And to make a long story short, how I came about with Farms to Incubators was I was a reporter for a local newspaper in Salinas Valley, California, which is uh, where agriculture is a $9 billion industry, a salad bowl of the world, 85% of the leafy greens are grown there. And I observed that there, there were not visible a lot of women leaders and decision makers at the helm for agribusinesses, for farms, and then for a growing sector called ag tech as well. So I decided to find uh, use storytelling as a platform to amplify the voices of founders in this space, especially at the time women of color. And that came about through the documentary, the short award-winning documentary that's now been screened over 200 times, including at South by Southwest. And also the new book that just came out that actually features some of the women, excitingly features some of the women in today's talk as well. <laughs> um, so what's the objective and the mission and the goal of all of the storytelling and all the events and talks is to have more girls, young women, women involved in ag tech. We want a pipeline for a new workforce in this agri-food tech space, which I think is so exciting. Uh, thank you, Amy. 
turning to Fatma, uh, I would like to ask you the same question. How did the idea to start Fernim come up? And can you tell us a bit how uh, about uh, your experience starting a business? Uh, thank you, Natasha, for uh, the very nice introduction. Um, I have a PhD in plant molecular and cellular biology and postdoc in um, isolating chemically, uh, biologically active compounds. And when the project, uh, when postdoc, when my postdoc advisor mentioned to me, we are going to be isolating mating pheromone from nematodes. And I thought, oh, this actually has a huge potential because I knew insect pheromones were used very successfully in agriculture. It was an eco-friendly solution. And I have a background uh, in agriculture. I actually come from a uh, farming family. My grandparents had hazelnut orchards and I knew how much it meant pest control and particularly eco-friendly one. And once we identified USDA hired me to apply the mating pheromone from nematodes from model nematode to agriculturally important ones, root knot nematode. It was a time that methyl bromide was removed from the market due to environmental concerns and farmers really didn't have a solution. And within two years, we have made a progress there, but within two to three years, the funding changed the government policies and it's uh, the position basically disappeared, but I had many of the scientists working with farmers and knew the potential. I knew the potential. We wrote a grant and it got funding. From there, slowly, slowly, uh, Fernham started, even though I never had an intention to start a company. I thought this would happen. I would have a faculty position and use the extension um, agents and work with farmers initially, but it was a different route, but the goal was the same. Then Farnham basically born slowly, slowly, and we got funding from Indie Bio Accelerator in San Francisco. And at the same time, USDA SBIR1, then I started working full-time and moved to California. From there, I've been working on it full-time. So our goal uh, currently, we have two uh, products, we are developing one is to improve beneficial nematodes efficacy and the second one is directly targeted to uh, plant parasitic nematodes and seed treatment. We are hoping that it will provide a really great uh, uh, solution for the farmers to control both insect pests and the nematode pests. Yeah, uh, thank you so much Fadma. I'm really excited on um, the potential that your innovation is bringing to pest control and that delivers like a better return on investments for farmers and uh, innovation that is very like eco-friendly. Uh, so um, allow me to go uh, to Penelope. Let me ask you the same question. How did the idea to start a persistent data <laughs> mining come up? Can you tell us what your experience starting a business and how you identified the problem you wanted to solve? Um, so I'm Penelope Nagel. I'm a ninth generation farmer. And I'm also a channel swimmer. And one of the things that I noticed was there was a lot of people out there saying uh, farmers were causing nutrient overload in our waterways. And as a farmer, I took some offense to that. And uh, I looked a little deeper. I um, have been involved in our family farm uh, for the last 30 years. I'm now obviously far more involved uh, being a ninth generation farmer. Our family has passed down for the last four generations through our females. And what I noticed was that we were taking one cup of dirt every four acres on our farm, sometimes two and a half acres and making a decision that affected 32% of our costs. Um, our co-founder, Brian Zmudio, uh, was working on a mining project using the hyperspectral technology uh, that we now use for soil nutrient analysis, which helps farmers be more profitable increase their yields, as well as protect our waterways, which was of high importance to me because now we can take more granular samples. Um, so more samples per acre in order to help fight climate change, um, hypoxia in our waterways, as well as save the farmers money and grow more nutritious food. As far as challenges, um, I'd say uh, funding is always a challenge. Uh, one of the things, and if you look at the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 
one of those goals is partnerships for sustainability. And that's been one of the keys to our success because we haven't had a lot of funding. Uh, we've been able to partner with a number of groups, including fertilizer companies, um, other agronomic service companies, as well as government agencies in order to, to take care of costs that we otherwise would have had to have covered if uh, we hadn't had these partnerships. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pelham. It's really impressive that it's the ninth generation of female farmers. I think it's not a lot of time that uh, we see that in America, in like developing countries. So that uh, a plus for in your family. Uh, let me go um, to Claire. Uh, in a few words, would you tell us what Wells Fargo Innovation Incubator IN2 is and what is the problem you're solving and how you're solving it? Sure. And um... Natasha and Raisa, thank you for moderating the panel and uh, thank you to the Water for Food Global Foundation. It's a pleasure to join uh, these great female entrepreneurs on the panel today. The IN2 program uh, is funded by the Wells Fargo Foundation. It's a philanthropic funding to help early stage technologies overcome uh, technical hurdles to reduce risks such uh, that investors and customers are willing to either spend cash or invest capital in those early technologies so that great solutions, such as you've heard from Fatma and Penelope, can get out into the market. It, it enables that um, it, crossing that technical valley of death, if you will, by sponsoring collaboration with the Danforth Plant Science Center. So it's through the, the third party um, validation of an institute like ours that's known worldwide for its uh, plant science digital imagery uh, algorithms that we work with five companies a year, either on um, uh, lab-based projects. And more recently, we are moving into being able to fund um, field trial type projects for technologies that are further along. So we, um, we, as I said, we've been around for three years. We've um, got 16 companies that are sort of part of our family, our community, and we um, are launching our annual cycle again to select five more companies. And the uh, shout out to the Water for Food Foundation, who is one of our channel partners who helps us source great companies. Uh, thank you so much, Claire, for that. And it sounds like you're doing a lot of like amazing work and working with uh, companies. I'll come back to you a little bit later and talk in depth about how I is impacting and supporting um, women in the ag sector. Um, let me go back to Amy. Uh, how, how did you become interested in the role of women in agriculture and agriculture innovations? And why did you focus on women of color? I know you touched base on that, but can you uh, give us a little more insight on that? Sure. Um, so there's excellent men and women, uh, both, you know, who are founders in the ag tech space, but I decided to, again, focus on the voices of women. I mean, women already play a huge role, I think, in decision making when it comes to the food systems. Uh, and, you know, also in terms of agriculture, I mean, um, you know, there, there is, quote unquote, the farmer's wife who, who is behind the scenes doing a lot of the work, but also women internationally produce 60 to 80 percent of the food in most developing countries and are responsible for half of the world's food production. And there are actually a lot of women uh, working in now in uh, the, the agribusiness sectors. But at the same time, I think it's a male dominated culture where women's ideas, voices, contributions um, have not been sought out or heard or amplified further. I mean, I still hear of stories from women that I interview and connect with who say that when they have an idea and a proposal in the boardroom, <laughs> I mean, it's like when they put it out there, it's like it's a bit radio silence sometimes. It's as if they weren't heard, but the same idea when pitched by a man, you know, people are like, oh, what is that about? Tell me more about that. And it's exactly the same idea. So I think that there's still a lot of work um, to be done. And like I said earlier, From Farms to Incubators started out by pure storytelling, but where it's headed is actually into its own initiative as well. And it takes work, it takes a lot of, um, uh, there's also challenges to get support for storytelling when it comes to women in ag tech. I talked about the book, you mentioned the book. Um, 
when I, when I talk about the book, I say a lot of the women climb Mount Everest to get to where they are. I refer to climbing Everest repeatedly in the book because of some of the challenges, Penelope noted funding as well, getting investment, getting attention, getting your voices out. But I myself have faced a lot of challenges too, you know, in writing the book, um, you know, when and even before writing the book, I was told, will anybody be interested in such a book? Even by my own mentor in journalism school, I went to Columbia, by the way, journalism school, wonderful mentor, but also just said to me, do you want to spend your, your weekends and your weekday evenings, like transcribing interviews? Do you think anybody's going to be interested in this? Um, and I proved him wrong. And he actually, he recently congratulated me <laughs> on the book and I ended up getting supporters if you look in the back of the book, all of those companies, all of the women who supported the book and made it possible. So what I'm saying is that I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of good work out there already. But I, I decided that, yes, this what I'm just sharing with you, climbing Everest is not yet completed. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, one common thing I think I heard uh, from you all is that you found potential and gaps in agribusiness that you, want, that you wanted to tap into. And some of these gaps still exist, as Amy just said, uh, there is still more work to be done. Um, allow me to go to the next question. Uh, we have all been faced with COVID-19 and I don't think anyone was prepared for the pandemic and its impacts generally. Uh, from our interviews here in Rwanda, talking to different entrepreneurs, we've learned how COVID was a blessing to some businesses and how other businesses had to close up. Uh, let's start with Fatima. How did the COVID-19 pandemic impact your business? and? And if you faced any challenges, what innovation did you use to overcome them? Uh, we did have many challenges from COVID. Number one, I would say, is funding. Uh, initially, funding was moving really forward, and all of a sudden, people were the financial instability or not knowing what's going to happen. Basically, fundraising stopped. And for startups, the networking events are really, really important. That is where we get to meet uh, you know, investors or many of those networking events were gone. Then how do you interact and how are you going to raise funds? On the wet lab size, we, we are R&D. So we actually work in the lab. In the first two months when, they, um, when everyone was asked to stay at home, we had to slow down and stop the lab work and we thought, well, maybe it is only a couple of months, <clears throat> maybe we can do many of the work at home. Yes, we did have some of the stuff and that the first two months might have stopped the lab, uh, you know, laboratory R&D, but we were still able to do, and it wasn't a, you know, we were still able to compensate. But once we got to November or December, we started having, you know, lag from all directions because it wasn't just us. Normally, if a startup, you know, to, if things didn't go right, we had collaborators and partners. We could ask them to do some of the other R&D work. Now, guess what? Their work is also stopped. And we had field trials because of USDA. That summer, we couldn't do the field trials. It wasn't just us that was impacted. It was our partners that were also impacted. We used university core labs Guess what? University is closed. What do you do? Um, their students were, um, you know, sent home. Some of them. We used to recruit from universities. Now the students were not at universities. What do you do? Our human resource disappeared, <laughs> and recruitment, was, which I didn't really think it would be a problem, but recruitment became such a big problem. Then even we. If we wanted to hire, we couldn't hire anyone for full time. So if we are half time in the laboratory, we just started actually having several months ago our interns, and we were hoping to have trained, uh, you know, students who had some lab experience. And then as we are interviewing, COVID, nobody actually was able to get a lab experience. They wanted to work in the lab for about, you know, it's almost two years. Then we thought, okay, maybe we're gonna train our students or the interns from scratch. And some of them didn't even know how to use pipettes. Normally, you know, when the universities are open, these students have this basic skills 
that we could utilize. So it affected us more way than we could ever imagine. Uh, are there like some innovations that you developed uh, to overcome those challenges currently? Well, we did utilize the time as best as we could. And I would say Zoom was one of the number one. We had uh, NSF uh, funding at that time. We uh, uh, applied for a supplemental funding and we did 164 customer discovery interviews. We talked to um, farmers, growers, distributors. We have learned about the market. So we did a different kind of research. And we still did the laboratory research that was slow. We were able to identify our beachhead market. We develop good uh, relationships and contacts with the farmers. They're all uh, during the Zoom, but uh, we did most, uh, most of them were business development market research. And we learned how the distributors adapt a new uh, product and we talked to farmers, the early uh, adopters we talked to, and we asked them, how are they interested? Or if they decide to test a product, how much lead time they, uh, they need? How do they make a decision to um, adopt a new product? And what are, or is it a single person or um, uh, how do they take that risk for a new product? Or where do they get their, uh, uh, pest control. And we learned that actually there was a quite a bit of difference between distributors who sell the chemicals versus chemical pesticides versus the ones that sell biologicals. And farmers were very much interested in biologicals and they really didn't want to use any harsh chemicals because they said when they use harsh chemicals, then it creates a problem that they didn't have before. And they were really concerned about um, pest resistance, particularly for thrips, which was a global problem. So we have learned it was a different kind of research we were able to focus. And Zoom was almost like we were at, on the Zoom pretty much day and night. So it wasn't total loss, but we had to be very creative to be um, still very productive. We did the best we can, we could. <laughs> Definitely. Um, thank you, Fatma. I, I believe uh, Zoom uh, really did uh, like a lot of savings for a lot of businesses during this uh, like pandemic. And I'm glad that you find like you found more, info you learned more information during this season that is going to, help, to be helpful to your business. Uh, allow me to turn to Penelope. Uh, can you please share how the pandemic impacted your business and also like what innovating solution did you use to overcome these challenges? So uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, necessity is the mother of invention uh, as has always been the case. And um, I was actually in Iowa uh, when, this, when this started last year. So I was presenting to the um, independent Iowa crop consultants. Uh, we were gonna start testing with them. Um, I remember showing up to the conference and uh, I stopped at a restaurant and the, and the guy behind the counter told me, sit down and enjoy yourself because this is gonna be the last meal you get to eat in a restaurant for a while. And uh, I remember just thinking this really can't be happening you know, that this, this can't be. And I, I showed up at the conference uh, that was supposed to have about a hundred people and there was nine people in the room. And um, so it was, a, it was a big letdown because we were really interested. We'd done so much testing in, in um, Iowa and, or Illinois and other states. We were really interested in uh, breaking into, into Iowa and doing some field testing with them. Um, Obviously, that, that was not my best conference uh, because no one could show up. And uh, from there, you know, I, I flew home, I, I got in, and at 8 p.m., they shut down our city. And, you know, you sit there and you think to yourself, what, what are we going to do? Like, I'm in the throes of trying to commercialize a product. And what ended up happening was uh, people would send us samples. And because we have a sensor, we could, we could still process data. 
So it actually helped us in being able to easily process data where I wasn't necessarily out in the field. So we were able to expand uh, more than we would have normally because now we were no longer in the field. Now there of course was some challenges because we have people taking samples. We don't know where these samples are coming from. We don't know how they were taken. Um, so it was a great training opportunity to, to be able to teach agronomists how to, to use our technology when we weren't there. So we made a number of videos. We made huge leaps um, regarding our software because, well, it's easy to, to do programming when you're not out in the field. So, so there was definitely some highlights. Um, right now, we've picked up <clears throat> about 240,000 acres that we're, we're testing on uh, with a number of agronomists that are, that are covering vast areas. And in all honesty, I don't know if we'd been out in the field if we would have had that because we really had to, to circle the wagons and figure out how we were going to sustain during, during this process. So I think uh, overall, it's been a it's been a I don't want to say it's been a good thing, uh, but again, necessity is the mother of invention. And sometimes uh, when we hit hardships, we have to maneuver around those. And I think I, I somewhat spoke to that uh, regarding funding. You know, if, if you don't have funding and you have something that's real, uh, you will find a way. And, and we've been able to continuously do that and uh, jump over all these hurdles and hopefully it, it all works out in the end. We're a number of, a, we're, we're one of many organizations globally that have been working on this research and one of just a few that are trying to uh, commercialize. So I think uh, <clears throat> this has been a, a, a challenge um, and it's uh, been interesting, obviously, psychologically. I think we've all had to um, really reevaluate a lot of things. But uh, overall, I think uh, we've made uh, the best set of lemonade out of the lemons we were handed last year. Uh, thank you, Penelope. I'm glad that uh, you managed to, to find new uh, invention during um, like this pandemic and like new opportunities such as like training more, um, more agronomists with is going to help uh, like you in the long term, which is going to help your business as well. Um, Amy, I know that you like yours is a little bit different from like uh, from other panelists. Can you tell us also like if this pandemic affected your business and how you managed to like uh, overcome them? Well, I guess I'm going to speak in a broader term because uh, storytelling and journalism is is a bit different. <laughs> I think uh, one thing I definitely observed through the pandemic is a growing interest in the food um, systems and the food space in terms of consumers. Um, you know, there was a growing interest actually in my own uh, project, you know, a new number of people wanted to increasingly screen the film or took interest in the book. I think I heard from more um, women themselves who said, did you hear about my company or did you know that this just launched? And I think it's because everybody on some very basic level uh, was affected by the you know supply chain. <laughs> it could have been um, challenged to get access to the, your favorite fruit or vegetable or product and so forth. So I actually saw that there is a there's a tremendous growing interest on the level of the ordinary people, consumers, farmers markets are also um, growing tremendously here in, the, in many of the communities. So in terms of from farms to incubators, um, the storytelling, uh, actually the opportunity to tell more stories grows as well. There are more companies, more uh, women led companies, I think co-founded companies that are in the space. So um, during the pandemic and then now and currently also seeking uh, funding to do a second documentary and a sequel and seeking the support from um, women to continue to graciously, generously share their stories and share their journeys as well. I certainly don't think uh, stories are possible if there isn't buy-in <laughs> from people sharing their stories. Um, and I also think that there's a growing number of 
writers and journalists who also want to tell the story of the of ag tech and the people behind the innovation. I think that's the critical part about this is not just the innovation, but also the people and their journey behind it. So I call them portraits, actually, that are within this book. Um, so you mentioned the challenges, so I'll address that and the opportunities is that um, we definitely want to do a second sequel for the doc for the documentary. The documentary is five years old now, and the women in there, some of them have stayed and some of them have left the industry, but there's a whole new wave of women, which is I'm excited about, who are in this space. There's growing subsectors in ag tech, like ag bio as well. And there's different ways of growing food, like aquaponic, hydroponics. So we've moved on to the second phase, I think now. <laughs> so it is time for an update and upgrade and also a new, potentially a new book. So we're seeking like-minded um, people who want to either share their stories, write the stories, support the stories also to continue, because I think without kind of continuing to beat the drum <laughs> and to climb the mountain, then there's a, there is a silence. And I don't know if anybody is going to push that, um, push that forward. Although I am very hopeful that there's, that it's moving in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what the documentary in the book is going to bring out. I know you featured in your first book uh, some of the panelists here. So I'm really excited uh, to read that. And I, I know, let me shift to uh, Claire. I know it looks different for you with the whole, uh, everybody else on the panelists. Like, was it also the same challenges? Did you face the same challenges? So can you tell us maybe a little bit how the, uh, the pandemic affected you and what were the challenges that I and I too, I and I too faced and how did you uh, overcome it? Sure. So um, many of the personal experiences that you heard from Fatma and Penelope, that their companies and teams faced, all of our companies faced those supply chain, um, uh, talent, uh, getting into labs to do work, all of that, our, our 16 companies faced all of that. I have to say, like Penelope and Fatma, they did what successful entrepreneurs do. They, they didn't wait, they brought creativity, they looked for ways around this relentless tenacity to go over and around and under hurdles is very characteristic of passionate entrepreneurs. So we saw that in our entrepreneurs. One of the ways that the program uh, adjusted was we just, we had to get patient and we had to get flexible about when projects got done. So the scientists in my institution, the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, we also closed down like many academic institutions. We had to, um, we had to wait until facilities could come back up and, and, and work could get done. But luckily the funding mechanism and the funding partner Wells Fargo were patient. So we, we could stop and start and, and reapply and be flexible on the funding side. The other thing that the three partners in IN2 do besides interact specifically with specific companies is we build ecosystems like the um, Darty Water for Food Foundation. We're all about building ecosystems. So one of the interesting things about Zoom is that our ecosystems have gotten more global. So because we can't get together personally, we are talking to, to people who wouldn't necessarily pay a lot of attention to our particular region or our institution or our programs, but we have the opportunity because everybody's virtual. So while we miss tremendously what Fatma talked about, that serendipity, that ability to build relationships, doesn't happen as deeply digitally, but at least we're, our eyes are getting opened and our relationships are expanding globally. So, so that's one tiny positive uh, feature. So the, the IN2 program, the Danforth Plant Science Center, the Wells Fargo Foundation and National Renewable Energy Lab, the other partner, we've just, we've tried to respond to entrepreneurs who need to be flexible by having a program that is flexible. We also, the, the, we gave out some small specific awards to channel partners who had some ideas on how to support the entrepreneurs in their ecosystems. So 
we we responded, we 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 were patient and we tried to find ways to still be uh, supportive and valuable. Yeah, it sounds like the pandemic a lot of busy doing like a lot of good work and finding like fundings. And I think one of the things that we heard from all the panelists is like being persistent and making sure like making sure you're keeping your eyes on the business and like finding innovative ways like uh, using Zoom or virtual uh, other social medias. So it sounds like there's a lot of innovative ways. Uh, moving on to the next question, I, I know like from the panelists and everyone in the room today, one thing we can agree on is that there's still a low number of um, women that we see on the seats and a lot of uh, few women as uh, ag, um, ag founders. So Fatma, would you uh, please maybe like highlight some of the reason why there are few women founders in ag tech and what can we do to have more women innovators in agriculture? I would say one of the first thing is there aren't enough women leaders or role models. I think role models is really important. When I started Ferenim, I didn't actually, you know, look for it. If I had seen a lot of women CEO, that might be one of the things naturally would come to me. And it never occurred to me the role model thing. One day I was in uh, uh, my son's middle class um, field trip and there was this little girl we were in San Francisco and the teacher introduced me as Dr. Fatma Kaplan and at the end of the trip she says hey excuse me are you really a doctor spelled with d-o-c-t-o-r and I said yes but if you're asking medical doctor I'm not a medical doctor but I do have a PhD I would be called doctor and it just hit me there and I thought we really don't have enough CEOs as women leaders in the field. If I, you know, if I had seen many, I would say, oh yeah, I will be a CEO. If you go to universities, I noticed, you know, uh, you see the profs, woman prof, and you see, oh, I can be a prof. Or uh, I think that is a really, really important part. And on top, women is really not encouraged, hey, um, have this position or that. You know, like Amy said, most of the time we're not really heard. And that is not really encouraging. We move to places that we're heard. And that's usually the, not the leadership positions. Uh, I would say one of the solution is creating a forum like today. And Amy's efforts and to show more women, you can do it too. When people ask me sometimes when they feature women leaders and can you tell me about any other woman leader you know? And I usually think, and, and I know a lot of women who's in ag. And then I start uh, selecting, okay, who's a CEO? And then all of a sudden when I have hundred people, I might have gone down to five. And then uh, I look for it, people ask me, okay, can you introduce me a woman startup, uh, the startups that are, you know, led by women and many of the accelerators I do know, I look around, I know a lot of guys who have a startup, which I do introduction to accelerators we've been to, but not really very many women. And I really look around and even for, you know, leaders, I had a Dr. Pam Marone, who's the leader of um, biopesticide business, and I'm still looking, are there any women just as powerful and just as influential? Not very many. And in one of the business journals, she's one of the 20 women since 1960s who had um, IPO'd and successful their you know, company. It's very few. Even in other fields, when we are, when I looked for it, it's very hard to find. I think funding, a lot of visibility, and make women's voice heard and their ideas recognized. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Fatma. I think one of the things that you mentioned is like we don't have like a lot of like role models, like maybe like 
if you hear like a nurse, it comes like really natural to hear like it's a woman who is like becoming a nurse. But like we can't like we can't expect to have a lot of like CEO women if we don't have like like our, our growing women that we see in the picture like big like men in usually like CEOs. And I think like that's a really uh, good point that you touched on. Uh, so before we move to the, our next question, uh, I would like to encourage all the audience to continue dropping questions in the chat. And please remember to be respectful and ask uh, questions strictly about today's topic. Um, the, question, the next question goes to Penelope. Uh, in the article by Amy Wu specifically about finding, uh, Nego mentioned that at Persistent Data Mining, it was part of the company's strategy to make uh, Penelope uh, CEO and top brand Zumodia a CEO. Uh, so Zamudia is the company's largest investor, but to be honest with you, it's easier to fundraise with a man. So uh, Penelope, would you maybe uh, explain why you think it's easier to fundraise uh, companies led by men? And can you briefly mention the social and gender bar barriers that you face as a woman starting a business? Um, <clears throat> so we have been told out the gate that, um, that women had a hard time fundraising. Um, so we've kind of been doing a dance here. Um, I am obviously the, the spokesperson for the company. Um, I've now taken on the role as president and CEO, which seemed or president while Brian is the CEO. Um, he has founded other companies, uh, but it is uh, it's difficult. And a lot of people initially uh, want to think that there is a man in charge and um, he, you know, I, I like to call this systemic apathy. Um, there, there's rules to the game. And uh, I believe that the work that we're doing um, is important enough that I can put my, my, um, my ego aside as far as who, who raises um, the money or who gets credit. Um, and, uh, you know, I think back on, on my family history, my, uh, my grandmother and my great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother um, were out there making sure that, that there was little details that were done and the men would you know take the harvest into town and uh, they would get credit. But it was oftentimes the, the work that the women did behind the scenes. And I think that's one of the, the difficulties that we face is that we are raised to, as women do the right thing because it's the right thing and not do the right thing because we're expecting credit. Um, so oftentimes I, I know this in my, in my own personal life um, and I mentor a lot of women. So uh, whereas I have lacked mentorship, obviously my, my family, my, my sisters are both well-educated and well-respected in, in their various fields, as well as my mother who was a geneticist. Um, but one of the things is, is that we've just been raised, even when we come from strong um, women foundation, that, that instead, of, uh, instead of looking for the mentor, I try to be the mentor. So it's a, it's a different way of thinking. So where I see a gap in, in how we, you know, I have a daughter and I have a son and where I see the gap, I try to fill the gap for the next person. And I think that's a trait that, that we historically see in women is that instead of trying to take credit or um, we move forward and, and fill the gap for the next generation because women have a tendency to think on a more long-term basis. Thank you, Penelope. I think it is uh, sad to hear that women have to put their like ego on the side so that the right thing or the needed thing to uh, like for it to be done. I believe uh, now, now like in the present, it's better than how it used to be in the past. And I hope to see more like women being role models, as Fatma said, uh, for young generation that are rising up, so that we, women won't have to put their ego on the side. Uh, turning to Claire now, what is the what is IN2's role in accelerating ag tech companies in general, and how does IN2 select companies for funding? Uh, I know we've heard uh, funding as a challenge in our discussion today, and I also know that you've mentioned uh, one of the things that IN2 does is building ecosystem, and I would like uh, for you to uh, touch on that. And what also 
what are some of the notable women-led companies that you have supported? So, uh, Natasha, with your with your permission, I'll start with the notable women and and back into the other things because I think uh, one of the ways we can help is to celebrate um, those women that we're terribly proud of that are in and who are in the front lines of struggling. So let me call out three. Uh, Atlas Sensors is a, a company that develops ion sensing for real time inline water. So, you know, the ions that escape from farming situations into waterways, if we know what's happening, we can, you know, we can solve that problem and not waste those ions and send them places they don't need to be. So that company um, was founded and led by Melinda Capel, and, and that's one of our ion two companies. Motor Leaf is, um, has developed a carbon book, so AI for um, uh, helping specifically greenhouse indoor growers monitor their uh, carbon footprint. Um, that's founded and led by Daphne Pruce. Um, uh, she's the CEO of that company. The, th the third, and we only have three founded CEO-led uh, companies out of our 16, so we, we, we would like to do better. Um, and so we, we task ourselves with, with doing better, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But New West Genetics um, was co-founded and is led uh, by Wendy Mosher in the CEO position. And they are doing the genetics to make hemp a real viable uh, crop new crop for farmers. So uh, a crop for the future, a crop for the landscapes of the future. Um, so one of the ways we try to do better is that we make sure that the review process is very inclusive. So our uh, committees that, that um, review companies are very, we're very conscious of populating them with gender diversity. So our technical review committee is led by men and women at the Danforth Center who are our scientists. The Wells Fargo Foundation review from, for the sustainable mission of companies in the program. Also, they strive to have an inclusive uh, found um, board that reviews. And then the final selection is made by uh, an environment um, a, an external advisory board made up of industry leaders. It includes not-for-profits like um, uh, the um, Darty Water Foundation. It includes industry giants. It includes uh, some consultants, some investors. That's also quite diverse by gender on purpose uh, because I think um, it's it's too easy to overlook women, and uh, we we purposely put women faces and women leaders into those review positions. So that's that's one thing that we do, but we also depend on our channel partners who are referring companies into us and uh, try to, we strive to communicate that we would like greater diversity. We firmly believe that you can't exclude half the globe's population that eats food and grows food they must be at the table with the solutions that solve our, our current problems. And so we can't exclude half the brain power of the world uh, when, when we're going to solve some of these tough problems. So I, it's not something easy to solve overnight. It is something that takes conscious, purposeful attention. It, it takes panels such as this, that people talk about this issue. And it, it takes women like Penelope and Fatma who are willing to be generous with their time with the next generation of uh, uh, women just to go into science, to go into business, to have the courage to look around for problems that they could solve and put teams together to solve those problems. Uh, thank you, uh, Claire. Uh, this question, this next question goes to both uh, Amy and Claire. According to SP uh, Global, firms with female S, S, uh, female CFOs were more profitable, generating excess profits of $1.8 trillion. Firms with uh, greater gender diversity on their board of directors were even more profitable and larger than firms with low gender diversity. Uh, Amy, what do you think women bring to the table and what are they doing differently in ag tech and agriculture in general that leads to these differences? 
So what I'm hearing from this question um, is that there aren't enough women at the C-level, is that correct? In, in agribusiness, large agribusiness companies or even startups. And I didn't catch the other part. Do you think you could repeat that? Sure. Uh, the question was, we saw changes of like uh, $1.8 trillion uh, of excess profit when female CFOs like were on the like in the firm in companies, and so the question was like, what do women bring to the table, and what are they doing differently in agriculture and ag tech that leads to these differences? Well, I previously noted that women already play a tremendous role in food systems and agriculture, and yet the ch the challenge that I had seen is that their voices weren't necessarily sought out and their perspectives and also their contributions actually are not noted. And I think it is critical that actually they be, it be acknowledged and, and documented because that is where, I mean, I can speak from the perspective of being someone in the media. I think like sh the, the power of storytelling, sharing, like CEOs, founders sharing their story out there telling the public about why they did this, what motivated them, what their innovation is about, reaching out and connecting with journalists is really critical. And on the flip side of it, media and journalists, um, you know, they, they, they need to actually seek out more diverse voices as well. Otherwise you end up having all the ag tech stories, I'm <laughs> being a little bit extreme here, <laughs> quoted and commented from male founders and stuff. Now we talk about the events, also today, which I think is wonderful. I think it's it's critical to have a balance of perspectives and diversity. I mean, what I have been trying to do using the film as a platform is to connect and get convene um, more women in the space into the discussions and conversations. And why is that important? Because I think diversity of perspective, uh, different perspectives and backgrounds only makes a business more rich and the products more rich. I mean, it's been proven time and time again through data, through reports as well, that um, if you have a wide range of people um, in terms of gender, age, backgrounds, experiences, it only brings much more to the table as well. So I think hiring is another <laughs> critical part of this uh, discussion as well, but I don't wanna to digress too much with that. Um, so I think I hope that answers that answers some of the question that women, women obviously bring a lot to the table and they're already very involved. I think the second phase of this is really to further find ways to get the next generation of women interested also. And there's been mention of mentorship um, and also internships is what I'm hearing. And also amplifying the, the women like Claire did, you know, three of the, the women founders in her center also. Um, and also the role of having a storyteller tell those stories. So I do think it's like an ecosystem and everything's actually connected in some way. So I think it's, it's working together um, as a community actually, yeah. Did you want me to respond to, to sort of that area? Great, I'm, I'm happy to. So I, um, I'm so glad that Amy's part of this panel because the ability to tell stories it is uh, just something that comes up again and again. Humans are motivated to do something by stories. And certainly women can't expect non-women to tell our stories. We have to tell our stories and, and, and shout out to Amy for, for doing that. Um, people even, so, so farmers, I hear again and again from the entrepreneurs that we work with, farmers don't make decisions on math they make decisions on their connection to the land, their trust, their emotional trust, human relationships with people. So stories are what glues people together. So, so stories are, are really important. Even investors, you know, you would think they're, all, they're gonna be driven by bottom line, but they also are moved by stories. They're moved by teams that um, you know, can connect to their customers and uh, seem to have solutions that, yes, they're going to make a profit, but they're going to make a profit because they connect fundamentally with a customer problem and they solve it better than somebody else. So, so learning to tell stories is, is, is really, really um, important. And it's, um, 
we need women on boards. We need women in investor partnerships. We need women CEOs. We need women on teams. We need young women getting encouraged to, to go into science, engineering. Um, and But I, I think what women bring to the table is perhaps a greater whether it's genetic or environmental, we could have a whole career on that, but perhaps we bring a better ability to listen to different voices in the best of cases and a propensity to collaborate and to solve problems collaboratively. So if you have a gnarly problem or if the your whole environment changes and you have to change directions, you have to be very creative. A, 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 you, you know, a dictator might be very efficient, but maybe not very creative. So, so doing things collaboratively, there are there are certainly situations for for entrepreneurs and innovation commercialization where you need to be very creative and you need you need to you need inclusion and diversity, but you need to be able to listen to that and include it. And so, I think women, perhaps in their best moments, do that. Uh, a mentor of mine once said, "There's a special place in hell for women who don't reach back and help women." And so, I, I sort of carry that on my wall as a you know a gray hair in this world and and that's that's a that's going to be my legacy is that that you must reach back and help other women yeah uh, i love that when when just mentioned that you have to reach back to uh to help other women uh, so before we move to the uh, question and answer part of today's session on women innovators uh, working to solve problem uh farming challenges i would like to ask a question to our panelists uh, what advice would you give to a woman trying to start uh, ag businesses? What opportunities are there and what do you think the agriculture industry would look like if we had uh, more women uh, successful in attaining uh, leadership positions? Uh, let's start with Fatima. Can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Uh, so the question was, what advice would you give to women trying to start ag businesses? what opportunities are there and what do you think the agriculture sector would look like if we, more women would be successful in attaining our uh, leadership positions? Let me start from the last one. If there were more women in agriculture, I think it would have been a lot more successful. I think we, as women, are very creative. And for the women um, who wants to get into ag business, there is never a good time to start a company. So if they believe that they have a good idea and whether they should or should not, they should try it. And they shouldn't hold back themselves. Oh, you know, I can do this thing when this happens. You know what? That thing will never happen or it will never happen at the right time. There is never a good time to start a company. The time right now is the best time. So uh, there are challenges. It is not an um, easy uh, place to be a startup uh, CEO or fundraising, but you know, good things never come easy. <laughs> and you have to believe in your vision. If you believe in your vision, you can make it. If it is something you don't believe, don't start it. But in your heart, you believe this is gonna make a difference. It's you who makes a difference, not so much the um, uh, surrounding. It will be challenges up and down with Fernand. We had a number of challenges up and down. I believe in this technology is gonna make a difference and it is getting more traction every year. And when we talk about it, we had a lot of um, uh, education. We even sent nematodes to International Space Station. We did the first agriculture biocontrol experiment in space, and we can do biocontrol in space. So there is no limit, I would say. Just believe in yourself. And we couldn't even imagine, I never even dreamed of it, that one day I would actually be able to send uh, nematodes to space. You know, while we are still doing the agriculture on Earth, that was unthinkable for me. And guess what it did? So believe in yourself and start wherever you are. You might think it's impossible, but once you start pushing, others help too. But have a very good supportive environment. 
and pick the people who are really supportive of your vision and supportive of you because you'll need them. There are a lot of ups and downs whenever it's mostly down. <laughs> so you need those people to lift you up. Yes, you have a good vision. You have to move forward. So I do have those people. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about how you are very like inspiration in like insp inspiring other women to like push themselves and finding like those groups around you and mentors to push even when you don't want to start like those businesses. And I think not only you you are like farming here, but also in space. That's really I think really amazing. Uh, so let me go uh, to uh, Amy. Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, the same question, what advice would you give to a woman trying to start our businesses and how, what would agriculture sector look like if you had more women in, in our sector? Yeah, I, I think Fatma actually brought up a lot of the points, which are all excellent, that um, I want to just, you know, further highlight and bold. I think that those were those were great and everything I really wanted to say. Um, I, I also strongly, strongly want to emphasize the importance of having that network and mentorship as well. Um, I don't think the word mentorship can be overused. I and mean, then I'll just speak from my experience is that having a, a, just a couple of women <laughs> or and, and, you know, men and women actually say that um, I really believe like these stories need to be told and let and continue with it means a lot because there are certainly a lot more challenges sometimes. And then just having keeping the eye on the prize, the, uh, your eyes on the prize, <laughs> I think has really helped me in the big picture of things. Um, and the big picture on this end is to say, okay, 50 years from now, I mean, I'll just give the book as an example. I hope that there will be young women who walk into their the library, and I don't even think we'll have a library 50 years from now, <laughs> but they may come across this book, maybe digitally and say, I don't even know why this, this is so interesting. Why was this book written to like, you know, amplify women? Um, they're all over. I mean, this is just part of the landscape. So as a history major, I'm also a history major from college. I kind of work my way backwards in that vision and saying, I want that to happen. I hope that can happen. So what will it take to have that happen is to keep, um, keep the vision up and keep sharing stories and keep reaching out. Um, connecting and asking, do you know of any women founders in this space? Um, I'm also working on a searchable directory with a few other women in, you know, who have a similar vision and we're hoping to share the directory out. More women can add their names to that. So um, yeah, I don't think I have much more to add with that, except that um, I, I, I'm very hopeful that we'll move forward and things will, there'll be more women entering the landscape. Um. So I apologize, this session is supposed to be one hour. So I don't know if maybe Penelope and Claire can just have like a few seconds and just like answer the question, then we can move to the q and I, I think we should all we should all contribute to Amy's searchable directory uh, would be one advice. So I, I'm excited for that to come out, Amy. Um, you know, the, the speakers before Fatma and Amy, they've touched on many, many of the points, but um, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to put a team together. So know your own strengths and play to those and find those people who have different strengths from you. But you're gonna have to tell a story to attract them, and you're gonna have to be prepared to fail, pick yourself up, and go on. So so whatever feeds your motivation and soul, know what that is. Whether it's other people, whether it's something else, um, you're gonna have to do that. Because it's 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 extremely um, satisfying, but it's hard. Otherwise, more people would do it. Agreed. Being a, being a founder is is hard work. Um, somebody told me a long time ago that if you're looking just to make money, um, starting a company, there's easier ways to do it than that. And uh, my passion is is really making a <clears throat> a difference in this world. Like I said, and, and Amy and, and Claire both mentioned mentorship. Um, when you don't have a mentor, be a mentor has, has always been one of the things that, that I found important. Um, so, so if you see a void out there, um, fill that void. Um, instead of uh, feeling like I didn't have a mentor, I decided that I would be a mentor and I, I could regale you with stories of successful women that I know as a result of, um, of having that ecosystem. 
Uh, so uh, thank you everyone and the panelists. I think that that's all the questions we had today. And I apologize that we're not able to uh, answer some of the Q&A questions that we had today, but uh, the time was not uh, on, our, on our side. Uh, if you missed this part of today's session, it will be made available as an on-demand session shortly and archived on Water for Food YouTube channel. Please continue to engage with us uh, on this topic on the Water for Food Slack workspace. And if you have more questions, you can ask them there. I would like to extend our gratitude and appreciation to each one of the speakers for an informative and interesting session. I think I've learned a lot today on different innovations that were put in place in the pandemic and how women are bringing a lot on the table, but they need to climb mountains to be heard as Amy mentioned um, uh, earlier. So, and even with all the emerging initiatives that have been started, recognize the opponent of women that uh, women have and can play in the ag sector, the, the numbers are, are still low. And so I hope that this was inspiring uh, for everyone as was for me. Uh, let's keep working together and encouraging each other and being mentors and me uh, having mentors on, uh, um, for us all. So that's all we had today.